Hello, listeners. This is just a short disclaimer before we actually start our episode. So, the following episode will be detailing the characteristics of Drax, a French river fae uh, or serpentine creature. There will be no subsequent references of the vampire Dracula, or Drac for short. So do not anticipate hearing of the plights of these blood-sucking paranormal beings. If now you have lost interest in listening to this episode, I implore you to choose another fae to learn about whilst exploring our Veil of Smoke and Gold podcast. Or if you are so inclined to hear about vampires, please compose an email to our veil of smoke and gold at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Deep in the slimy bed of the river Rhone that slices through southeastern France, there lay beings. To most, they go unseen, though not unheard. Those sane enough to have seen them and survived confide in no one. Others are driven to the edges of any logical thought, running frenzied through the cobbled streets of Europe. The rest are dead dragged into the water, or ravaged in secret on its banks. Long ago, when horses were the main mode of transportation, and knights parading about in their gleaming suits of steel, obliging princesses in silks of lilac, midnight blue, and lemon yellow trimmed in gold. A small town was nestled where there now lies the commune of Bucare. The village was secluded to the point that no one other than the townsfolk knew of the constant disappearances that plagued their streets. Young women would go to the Rhone to wash their linens and never return. Children frolicking around the market stalls, would vanish like smoke on the wind. Petite Anu, or Little Lamb, as she was known, was the fairest and most virtuous maiden in the land, and was desired by every man inhabiting Bucare. They all approached her in their best attire, and with jewelry made of the finest shells, beseeching, Oh, darling Petite on you, accept my gifts of adoration and grant me your hand. But she denied them all. Only when the baker's son met her on the banks of the Rhone, bearing pale wildflowers harvested fresh from the fields, did Petite on you's heart soften. Your humility and kindness should be the envy of all, she said. It is truly gratifying to meet someone so honorable, and for that I will wed you. The betrothed couple embraced, but Petite Anu in her back, blood spattering the soil and staining the fabric of Petite Anu's dress with dark crimson, as she was ripped from her fiancé and pulled toward the Rhone by an invisible force, all the while unable to make a sound. The baker's son retrieved a silver dagger from his belt and set about jabbing the air, surrounding Penny Anu's struggling form, until the blade was met with physical resistance. While he was unable to see his foe, the young man managed to find enough purchase in what appeared as the air, to slice downward, 
driving the knife point deep into the riverbank. The hold on Petite Anu released, and a figure collapsed in the dust next to her, flickering into visibility. As the baker's son came upon the lifeless beast, he saw that it was a slender, serpentine dragon with ruffled teal scales. The man wrenched his hunting knife from the dragon's tail, where it had punctured a vulnerable point in its armor. Oh, thank you. You saved me. Petit Anu sobbed and they kissed. Then, the couple hefted the sea serpent corpse upon became aware of a tugging sensation at her skirts, though the air was still and quiet. Ripples erupted in the water, as though the river were shivering with morbid anticipation. The faint glimmer of what appeared to be an orb fractured the reflection in the water. Suddenly, pain seared shoulders and made for the town. Once they reached the streets, the village folk wept to see the demon that had caused so much discord vanquished. Men and women alike formed masses around the boy, each proclaiming their gratitude and stroking the dragon skin in amazement. Long into the night, the people celebrated raucously, stoking bonfires, feasting upon the fresh fruits of their recent harvest, and dancing to the music of ceremonial drums and the shrill notes of piccolos. Never again did the town suffer because of the beings in the realm. Salutations, listeners. I'm your host of Our Veil of Smoke and Gold podcast, Annalise. And the theme of this episode is Drax. As was clearly articulated in our disclaimer, the discussion is not about the paranormal monster Dracula, or Drac, and there will be no further mention of him throughout the episode. Drax have taken many forms in French mythology, which is where they originated, being sometimes portrayed as an invisible dragon or demon that preyed upon the innocent, residing in the major rivers of France and slaughtering children and young women, either on riverbanks or discreetly in their underwater den. In other accounts, Drax were said to be shape-shifting fairies without a definitive form, who lured ignorant people, having a particular affinity for children and virgins, into their river abodes, and occasionally stole wet nurses to raise their offspring. Though they had a propensity to be invisible, sometimes the Drax would create the mirage of a golden chalice rising from the depths of the river in order to entice passers-by, or they would skim the water on wooden plates as small people. There wasn't a lot of material in the world of fairy literature on this creature slash fae type being, so I will be touching on some other similar French water dragons and French river fairies. But without further ado, let's discover more of the legend, characteristics, history, and meaning of the Drac and what they represent to us as people.
origins, first writings, and role in history. The word drac derives from the Latin draco and the Greek draken, both of which mean serpent or dragon, with their root words meaning to watch or to guard with a sharp eye. Drax can refer to any number of fae, including being used as a broad term for French water fairies or describing a form of a water dragon. The latter is how the Drax are portrayed by Gervais of Tilbury, a canon lawyer, statesman, and cleric from the Kingdom of Arles during the medieval period. His most prominent work, the Atia Imperialia, meaning recreation for an emperor, when translated from Latin, an encyclopedic work from the early 13th century, detailed many European myths, including what may have been the first explicit reference of the Drac. Gervais described them as, quote, having their abode in the caverns of rivers and occasionally floating along in the stream in the form of gold rings or cups, enticing women or boys who are bathing on the banks of the river. End quote. Though Gervais was an Englishman, most believe the actual notion of the creature originated in France due to its heightened atmosphere of superstition and the mysterious disappearances that were common during the medieval times. Frederick Mistral, a French author in the 1800s, composed a book about myths from his region of France, which happened to be in and around the town of Bucer. This town is located on the Rhone River, as was stated in our story. Mistral claims that Drax are, quote, invisible winged serpents, water dragons, end quote, who left their watery home in the 13th century to hunt and kill thousands of men. French tales, such as Bluebeard. By the way, if you wanted to know more about this particular fairy tale, check out the Bluebird episode on Singing Bones podcast, available on most podcast sources. Bluebeard exemplifies the type of tale that arose from the time's ubiquitous events of murder, rape, and abduction. The same theories that revolve around the classic German tale, the Pied Piper of Hamelin, can also be applied to the inspiration of the Drac. The Pied Piper has been theorized to be a figure of death, and the idea of the Drac could have been constructed as an explanation for children and young women perishing of natural causes such as landslides, drownings, animal attacks, and deaths due to disease, which was ubiquitous at the time with the proliferation of the Black Death throughout Europe. The insatiable appetite of an invisible beast could additionally have been a sort of metaphor for immigrants or runaways like how the Pied Piper is presented on the official Hamlin website, stating that, quote, the children of Hamlin would have been in those days citizens willing to emigrate, being recruited by landowners to settle in Moravia, East Persia, Pomerania, or the Teutonic land, end quote. However, instead of settling in Moravia, 
East Persia, etc. The people the story of the Drac would be referring to would likely have moved to settle in the region of Greece or Constantinople, which were the most common destinations of French immigrants at the time. But again, these are all simply theories. No one knows where the Drac came from. Is it a figment of Gervais's imagination? An explanation? A documented part in history? A real beast lurking in plain sights on the streets of France? What do you think? Nature, or personality, physical characteristics, and abilities. When visible, Drax appear as any other serpentine dragon, with an elongated, scaled body, punctuated by stout wings between the fore and hind legs. Most often, Scales are iridescent, and can come in a plethora of colors. The head being especially armored, with a similar protracted appearance as the rest of the body, and decorated with two horns, as well as a forked tongue. A trait shared by their cousins, the snakes. However, as shapeshifters, Drax have many additional forms, both inanimate, humanoid, and somewhat spiritual. In some stories, they walk amongst us as human, both men and women, indistinguishable from any other passerby, essentially hidden in plain sight. This is a different form of invisibility, which will be discussed later when we analyze this fae. Other times, they are portrayed as minuscule beings with ears that come to sharp points and can be seen skating on plates on the surface of rivers. These plates are often wooden. Or, they hover just above the river, either as pulsating orbs of purple light that give off a warm glow, or a golden chalice bedecked in rubies ascending from the water's depths, rippling into existence just as the victim steps onto the riverbank. magical characteristics and abilities. The Drac's most prominent magical feature is its invisibility. This ability permits them access to different human civilizations and involves their entire body, scales, bones, and organs included, becoming unable to be viewed by the human eye. Though, it is said that animals can sense their presence. Maybe they're just more perceptive than we are. Scientifically, since objects can be seen by light in the visible spectrum from a source, reflecting off their surfaces and hitting the viewer's eye, specifically their retina, the most natural form of invisibility, whether real or fictional, is an object that neither reflects nor absorbs light. That is, it allows light to pass through it. So, by some magic, the Drac are able to alter their visibility and allow light to simply pass through them. Dracs also maintain the ability to shapeshift, a magical capacity that goes by many names 
including physical transformation, transmogrification, and metamorphosis. However, whether the drac actually undergo a full change into a completely different form or manipulate light to construct a mirage of the aforementioned items and beings, such as rings, chalices, little figures skating on wooden plates, etc., is not specified in any account. Though, if their invisibility is any indication, they do have an affinity for light manipulation. So, the latter is far more likely. But, again, the telephone effect over centuries of differing cultures and minds interpreting this story could have become so muddled that while it seemed that the drac took many forms, it may have been all different accounts of the same story, like the blind mice and the elephant, in which blind mice are all touching different parts of the elephant, but think that they're seeing a myriad of different things. Habitat, homes, and relationship with other fairy folk. As I said previously, there seems to be a dearth of information regarding the Drac. Specifically, their relationship with other members of the magical world. Since I have heard nothing to the contrary, I am going to assume that they are generally antisocial and territorial towards other fairies and mythical creatures. However, among their own species, Drax tend to be very congenial, sometimes living solitary in an underwater cavern or cave, or with a colony in an underwater city. Both abodes are said to be located beneath the waters and in riverbanks of French rivers, most notably the Rhone in the southeast of France that stretches into the borders of Switzerland, and the Seine River. I am not entirely sure that I said that correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Located in the north and northeast of France. Though this description does not directly relate to the Drac, the Swedish story Agneta and the Sea King contains the most beautiful prose about an underwater city and palace, and it really stimulated my imagination for what the homes of the Drac look like. So. I wanted to share it with you. The following snippets are direct quotations from Agneta and the Sea King by Helena Nyblom. Quote, It's beautiful down there, much more beautiful than up here on Earth. The sun shines twice as clear through the water without burning. And when storms and rain rattle at your houses up here, the bottom of the lake is quiet and still. Little waves sounded like harps. At night, when the moon rose, the water shimmered like silver. And when the sun rose, everything was illuminated in enchanting colors. In a moment, thousands of blue sparks lit up. Then the light flamed like gold or glowed turquoise. Then again, everything became pale and flowed in lilac streams 
like the summer clouds in the sky. Strange flowers grew on the floor of the lake, but when you smelled them, they had no scent. Like birds of the air, fish glided overhead. There were whole schools of golden fish, bright with sunlight. There were carp with red fins, silvery trout, and strange, silly burbot, motionless in the water, with only their gills moving, as if talking to themselves. The banquet hall was a deep green veil. High above, a crystalline green dome seemed to arch with a great golden lamp in the center. This was the sun shining through the waters. And following a river, it was even possible to reach the sea. The reeds at the water's edge bowed low, and the river became broader and broader until it opened up into the wide, infinite sea. End quote. Relationship with humans and how to find, interact with, lure, trap, or repel them. Rather ostentatiously, Drax have proven themselves to be vicious and unkindly, or otherwise indifferent towards humans. Children are their preferred food as their flesh is supposedly softer and more flavorful, while adults, mainly women, are lured to do the Drax bidding, as their flesh is detested for its toughness. Not quite sure if that's a compliment. Young maidens of reproductive age would be taken to care for the Drax offspring, doing the work akin to a wet nurse, such as breastfeeding, cleaning, and feeding the children. By the way, in case it wasn't clear, there are female Drax, but either they choose not to deal with their babies, legitimately can't provide the nutrients, or whatever is needed to support their offspring in the first years of their life and are therefore dependent on humans. Or the Drax have some kind of unique birth system, like seahorses. Anyway, these women would continue their service for a total of seven years. After which point, the Drac who kidnapped them would remove all memories of their time below the river. There are exceptions where memory removal doesn't work, and this will be described in our second story. And they will return the women to their families. As for repelling Drax, since it would obviously be masochistic and stupid to lure a bloodthirsty water dragon to your doorstep, there actually wasn't a lot of information. So my best advice would be simply to be wary while near rivers or any other bodies of water in general, and to keep a watchful eye out for anything or anyone suspicious. Essentially, 
follow water safety recommendations and do not willingly follow strangers anywhere. Nobody has a puppy in their car that they want you to see. And seriously, wear a life jacket. It's not a joke. I have a second cousin my age that literally drowned due to the capsizing of a small fishing boat in a terrible tragedy that involved him, unfortunately, not wearing a life jacket. I never truly got to know him, but the grief his family has been afflicted with is horrendous, particularly for his brother, who was with him and in fact wearing a life jacket. Having thus survived, though not without first witnessing his brother's death. I wanted to pay a small homage to this cousin and his family in this episode because I cannot even begin to comprehend what they are going through. So I'm going to observe a moment of honorable silence. Thank you for honoring my cousin in this way. And that concludes Drax episode part one. Thank you for listening. So, in part two, our next episode, we will discuss a second story. We'll analyze that story as well as the messages and meanings that the Drac give us in ordinary life and then specifically in my life. Please leave a rating and review on whatever podcasting source you're listening to this from. It really encourages me to continue making the podcast. And feel free to shoot me an email at ourveilofsmokinggold at gmail.com regarding any concerns, feedback, suggestions on fairies, or anything else you really want me to know. I appreciate any feedback though I prefer if it were constructive instead of just this podcast is bad because that does not help me improve. This is Annalise on our Veil of Smoke and Gold podcast. Thanks again for listening and I will see you in part two.